there are some great promises in God's word. Uh, I wonder what your favourites are as you think of what it means to be saved, what it means to know God's comfort in times of trouble, that he's our rock and our refuge. But in the book of James, we read last week a wonderful promise. And it was in chapter 4, verse 10, and we're reminded of these words. If you humble yourself before the Lord, he will exalt you. That's a glorious promise. And what we're going to look at today is how we can know that we are humble. Of all the things in the world, wouldn't it be a glorious thing for God himself to lift us up? For the God who knows you, the God who knows what's best for him to put you in a place where he says that's an exalted place. Well, let's come together. It's James in chapter four, and we're going to start reading from verse 10, and we're going to finish the end of the chapter. So here's God's word. James chapter four and verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against another. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbour? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a place and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So how do we know that we have a right heart, a humble heart, the God of heaven can exalt? And what James does in this little section here, instead of saying this is what a humble heart is, James flips the coin and he looks at what a proud heart is. And he asks the question as we look at this this evening, are the characteristics of a heart that God despises? He despises a proud heart. He lifts up the humble to see where we are and how we can come before the God of heaven and uh, seek his grace. You see, as we go through these things and we find that our heart isn't humble, it is proud. Well, James in chapter four and verse nine, we have that wonderful characteristic of a man or woman who sees sin as it is. And this is what James said your response should be. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Don't make excuses for sin. If, as you listen tonight, you think, well, actually, that's me. I'm not displaying that humble heart. When you come to God's word, you know this, that he doesn't despise a contrite, broken heart. Uh, Psalm 51 reminds us, verse 7 a broken and a contrite heart the Lord will not despise and so when you come and you say Lord forgive me that's not how I am I'm not reflecting an attitude that's humble I want to take sin seriously then James goes on in chapter 4 and verse 10 the humble heart that he lifts up and he exalts so let's come and humble ourselves and as we hear these words to say Lord there are areas of my life that need to change. And I know the one that I come to is able to forgive and to cleanse and to make me new. And so as we look at the proud heart, we need to say, are those actions or attitudes reflected in me? So here's the first thing about that heart, a proud heart, a heart that won't be exalted by God because God's opposed to the heart. And it's a heart that speaks negatively. Uh, did you see that in verse 11? Uh, James says, do not speak evil against another brother. It's easy to hide and say, well, uh, I'm not speaking lies. I'm not speaking an untruth. Uh, some people do say lies and they pull people down with lies, but not me. I wouldn't do that. I'm just telling the truth. No, it's possible to even use the truth. But your goal is the same. It's verse 11 to speak evil against someone. It's with a purpose of bringing someone down. And why do we do this? Well, we bring people down because the proud heart feels 
it should be exalted. Instead of the Lord being the one who lifts us up and exalts us, we feel we should be exalted ourselves. And so to do that, we often have to say things, even a truth, just so people know about other people, maybe their past, maybe things they've done. And instead of restoring and instead of uh, going to a brother or a sister and putting things right, it's just so it's out there, so people know, so people can be brought down low. And the Bible tells us God despises that. It's not an attitude that he loves. In fact, if you see the reason why, and there's a, a clear reason why, it's actually against God's purpose for us. Uh, read again verse 11. The one who speaks evil against a brother, or judges his brother, speaks evil against the law, and judges the law. If you were to think for a moment, what was the purpose of the law? All of the law and all of its intricacies. Uh, there were times when Jesus asked uh, even law uh, uh, makers, uh, those who were applying God's law in the Old Testament and in the New. And he came and he would say to them, how, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, how do you understand the law? And they summed it up as God's word summed up the law, as loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And then love your neighbour as yourself. And so if you think of all the law and all of its intricacies, it's the centre of loving and living for the God of heaven. But it's also loving your neighbour as yourself. And so how is it possible to be a man or a woman who loves my neighbour and yet with that breath or with the life that God gives us, actually using our strength and our words to pull our neighbour down, our brother down? And so James is challenging all of us by saying, it's easy to say I love Jesus. It's easy to say I serve Jesus and my heart is for Jesus and I love the things Jesus loves. I love, I love his law. But by bringing down my brother with a proud heart, I'm actually against God's law. Now you think for a moment, what could God say about you? If the God of heaven had an opportunity to just tell the world what sort of person you were, what could he say publicly? There's nowhere to hide the thoughts that you've had, the things that you've done in secret. There's so much that he could say that's true, that's honest. And yet what has God done? In his amazing love, he sent a saviour. Now listen to how James puts this. There's one lawgiver, verse 12, and judge, and he's able to save and destroy. And God in his great mercy has come with his law. And he has challenged us, but has shown us there's been a way, a way made through his son to know life and to know salvation. And if we become those men and women who speak harshly, we're actually saying, look, God knows me intricately. And yet what does he do? He shows mercy and he brings life. Even in challenging me in my sin, he brings life. But he wants to renew me. He wants to... Uh, make a new man, a new woman of me. And yet what do we do? Not knowing what people ultimately think, not knowing their hearts, we become those who speak of others so harshly because we've forgotten God's mercy to us. We've forgotten how God, the God who knows us, treats us. And so that's the rebuke in verse 12. It goes on. There's only one lawgiver. He's able to save and destroy. But verse 12, but who are you? Who are you to judge your neighbour? Do you really know your neighbour? You know yourself. You know the thoughts that you have. And you know the things that you do in secret. You know how the God of heaven sees you. And yet ultimately you don't know your neighbour. Uh, people often say you don't know someone until you live with them. And it's true. Uh, you can only make an assessment. And yet we come before people making an assessment to do something that even God in his graciousness hasn't done to us. He showed mercy, but we want to pull down and destroy. Now, there's something at the heart of this. And what's at the heart is we've forgotten God's amazing grace. There's a wonderful story in uh, the Bible, in the book of uh, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 7, where a Pharisee comes to meet Jesus Christ. And when he meets Jesus, a woman rushes in and she anoints Jesus' feet. And he's horrified because he looks at this woman in all of her failing, all of her sin and thinks, 
if Jesus actually knew who she was, well, he'd push her away. He looked at that extravagant gesture and thought it was wasted on Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus reminds that Pharisee that the reason he looks at that act and sees it and judges the woman and judges the situation is because, well, he who has been forgiven little loves little. Simon, the reason you're looking at the woman and thinking how wicked she is, but how righteous you are, is because you actually think you don't need to be a saviour. You don't need to be forgiven. The woman's responded because she realises I'm her only hope. And she, out of love for me, the saviour of the world, she gives everything. But you haven't even washed my feet. You haven't even washed my hands. You haven't given me the best. Because you feel you need no forgiveness. And so James comes and says, you know what the proud heart does? Instead of looking and saying, I haven't been given what I deserve. God has been graceful to me. The proud heart says, I have the right to deal with others the way God hasn't dealt with me. And to look down on them. And God said he despises that. He opposes that. Because God loves the humble heart. But there's something else about uh, the proud heart. Not only does it speak harshly of others. But the proud heart presumes there will always be a tomorrow. Uh, there are people in the marketplace in verse 13 and they're planning. Uh, isn't it a lovely way James puts it? They come and they say tomorrow and today we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade there. And we're going to make profit such and such. It's life, isn't it? It could be any town, any situation. The proud art thinks I've got a plan and I'm going to work that plan and nothing's going to get in the way. And yet the humble heart lays their plans before the Lord. It's a good thing to plan. Uh, we are told, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. But we've got our ways. And the book of Proverbs reminds us to bring our ways and our plans, but lay them at the feet of Jesus. And what's happening at the moment is not the way I intended it or long for it to be, even as a church. But we humbly come, trusting that our king knows the best. And humility does that. Humility comes before the God of heaven and says, today you've given me. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad in it. This is the day. He hasn't promised me tomorrow. He's promised me an eternal tomorrow. But he hasn't promised me uh, a Wednesday or a Thursday. He's promised me today and to use today for his name. And so the proud heart says, I put my plans in place. And when my plans aren't as they should be, it's frustrating. It makes me angry. But not the man or woman who's humble in heart. And as we come tonight to pray, uh, maybe some of your plans have been thwarted. Uh, they've been put aside. And how do you respond to this? Well, James says, this is how you respond. Not with a proud heart in frustration saying, why are these things taking place? But in humility, listen to how it says in verse 14. Uh, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. It's a wonderful thing to be as we come to pray, if the Lord wills. You know, we look at the church, the life of the church. God bless and we trust you. And we put our, our prayers and our longings before you and know that you do well. So let's come and pray tonight. Let's pray for our community. Let's pray for the lost. And let's pray for this generation. And let's pray that as Christians that we be patient and humble and say, Lord, we trust you. And we want to build up your people. We don't want to pull them down. We want to use words to build up and to show the heart of the Lord is in my heart. Loving my neighbour as myself. Loving the Lord my God with all my being. And I'm that person who knows this, that I've been given breath for today. Breath for today. To live for Jesus Christ.